Tesla stock and Palantir stock. It is a dedicated video. We have a lot to go through in regards to these two stocks here today. So many developments, so many things that just come out in the past uh, couple days in regards to Palantir stock and Tesla stock. And I thought, let me do a dedicated video going over both of these stocks here today. Thanks so much for joining me, folks. Also, in the comments section, let me know if you own both Tesla stock and Palantir. I'm genuinely curious how many people own both stocks. I'm certainly obviously one that owns both stocks, but I'm really curious how many of you guys watch this video own both of these stocks, and they've had tremendous years. Let's call it what it is, okay? Palantir's up over 200% this year. Tesla's up over 100% this year. And, uh, you know, you're always going to have a lot of haters in regards to these two stocks. It's just, you know, Let's be honest, okay? You know, a stock like Palantir has performed over 200% this year. Most people in index funds hope to get that sort of return over, what, a 15-year span, a 20-year span. So stocks like this are going to attract a lot of negativity. They're going to attract a lot of short sellers. They're going to uh, attract a lot of, uh, you know, even negative attention and things like that. They're performing tremendous. NVIDIA is another great example of that. NVIDIA stocks up 200 something percent this year. And look at how many people want to trash NVIDIA and try to bring it down and try to make up whatever they want to make up in their own head and about NVIDIA's faking orders and all this stuff. And at the end of the day, um, it, it's all, it, uh, it is what it is. Okay. If there's that much success out there, it puts pressure on a lot of other people because People play a competition game with other people, and then they feel like if somebody's doing better, then they want to pull that stock down. They want it is what it is. Okay, it's the stock market for you. So appreciate you guys joining me as always. Thanks so much. Uh, before we get into all this here today, two things I want to draw your attention to. One is I put up a very in-depth video late last night on this channel regarding my views on the market in 2024 and what stocks I think are going to do well, what stocks are going to think are going to do bad. So after this video is over, if you want to check that out. I think it's definitely a video that's worthwhile. That's a video that's going to be very relevant over this next couple months here. And also, seven days away, folks, seven days away from the massive once a year sale. Everyone needs to be signed up for this. We have, I think, 700 people ready to rock and roll. Every single person, you guys need access to this, unless you're in my private stock group. If you're in my private stock group, you don't need access to this. That's a whole other level. But everybody else, you need access to this. 62 bucks on Black Friday. It's a holy smoke, it's a saint, no joke, is deal. You get my Become Master Stock Market course, which is a $997 value. Plus, you get to see the moves I'm making in the market through that portfolio, through Fidelity Investments, plus Discord chat access. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Pin comment down there. Sign up for it. We'll send you it over. You know, I know a lot of people don't know how to value stocks properly, especially growth stocks. I have so many videos in that Become Master Stock Market course that goes all into valuing stocks. Should help you out tremendously. Okay. Pin comment down there. Get ready to rock and roll for that one. Seven days away. All right. So... Tesla is first off. Man, do we have some stuff to get into in regards to Tesla here today. Okay, first off, Sweden's Tesla blockade is spreading. Starting Friday, dock workers in all Swedish ports will refuse to offload Teslas, cleaning crews will no longer clean showrooms, and mechanics won't fix charging points of as the labor dispute rages on. So what's going on here? Well, Swedish workers are uniting against Tesla. From tomorrow, cleaners, this just came out a few hours ago here. From tomorrow, cleaners will stop cleaning Tesla showrooms, electricians will stop fixing the company's charging points, and dock workers will refuse to unload Tesla cargo at all Swedish ports. What started as a strike by Tesla mechanics is spreading in something Swedish unions describe as an uh, existential battle between Elon Musk's car maker and the uh, conventions that, you know, the bottom line is, folks, inflation. Inflation, inflation, okay? When you have high inflation, you're going to see so much of this crap. This does not mean Tesla's a bad company or they're, you know, they're, they're the worst. Look at this. Oh, my gosh, the Sweden workers are straight. This is going on with every freaking company right now. All these automakers is going on with. I just saw Starbucks here in Vegas. A lot of uh, workers are doing walkouts, uh, some about red cups. I don't know, okay? All I know is it's like every freaking company right now. And it's because we've had sky-high inflation for two years. When you have sky-high inflation, you... Everybody starts pointing the finger at everybody and starts saying, I need more money. I need more money. All my stuff's gone up so much. And so they start looking at whoever employs them. It's what goes on. Okay. No, I also saw this here today. Elon Musk backs anti-Semitic claim. Tesla shares tumble. Elon Musk on Wednesday wrote, you have to be, or you have, you have said the actual truth in response to some post around Jewish communities, uh, dialectical hatred against whites. I, I'm not getting into all that. All I know is Elon Musk needs to watch himself, okay? Elon Musk needs to watch himself. Because I'm telling you, okay, I grew up Catholic, and I can just tell you, 
the people that run Wall Street are Jewish and Catholic. Okay? They're Jewish and Catholic. And so, watch yourself a little bit here, Elon Musk. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Very, very powerful individuals. Much more powerful than you think, Elon Musk. Okay? You know, you got to watch it. You got to watch it. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay? Now, I was trying to figure out, like, did this actually have a negative effect on Tesla stock today? And I believe it actually did. I was looking at the volume in regards to Tesla here today, and it looks like about 135 million shares traded hands, um, when about 121 million usually trade hands. So, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get into the specifics of whatever's going on there with the Elon Musk thing, but all I know is he's got to watch himself. Because this ain't the SEC, okay? That's all I'm going to say about that. It's a whole different ballgame. Now, I also saw this here today. Court rules Tesla can block factory workers from wearing union t-shirts. So I guess there was a worry that uh, some employees would wear union, like pro-union t-shirts while on shifts at Tesla, right? Tesla did, did not violate U.S. labor law by prohibiting workers at its flagship Fremont, California assembly plant from wearing pro-union t-shirts a federal appeals court uh, basically ruled overall, right? And once again, this gets into this whole massive situation, right? Uh, now, also, the UAW has said that it plans to aggressively unionize at non-union U.S. auto plants after winning new contracts at the Detroit 3 automakers. President Joe Biden said last week that he supported the union's efforts to organize workers at Tesla and Toyota, right? So they're coming. They're coming. The unions are going to try to come into uh, Tesla's situation and disrupt it. That's the bottom line with that, okay? And they're going to try a million different ways, but they're going to try to unionize Tesla. So, you know, in the way I would kind of put this is, you know, it's kind of like somebody coming, you know, you get you get married to somebody, you know, whether you're female or male watching this, you get married to somebody, okay? And then you got some middleman that comes in and, and tries to divide you and says, you know what, I don't think you guys are doing your marriage properly, so I'm going to be the middleman in this marriage to make sure everything's done properly. And you're like, what? Yeah, some people might like a middleman out there. A lot of people don't want anybody getting in their, their business, right? And, you know, when you're talking about workers... And a company, it's kind of a bit of a marriage, right? And just like a marriage, people can go the other way. The same thing in regards to a company. And so these unions are hungry right now. The union membership has been falling for decades now at this point in time. I'm showing you right now the rate of union membership of employees in the United States from 1983 to 2022. And keep in mind, obviously, the population in the United States has grown immensely bigger over time. There's a lot more companies out there than certainly there was in many prior decades. And uh, yet, Union membership has just been falling. And this is, a, at the end of the day, folks, this is a byproduct of low inflation. We really haven't, we hadn't had inflation be an issue since really the 1970s. And you, if you look back at the 1970s, 1980s, where union membership was at, it was off the charts, right? This chart only really goes back to 1983. But if you even back it up to the 70s, it was off the charts as far as how many people belong to unions. It was crazy high. But that was a very different time. That was a time period of very high inflation. The 1970s was marred by high inflation. And as inflation became less and less of a you know, factor, what ended up happening was union membership went down and down and down and down over years. On top of that, a lot of companies that basically were unionized ended up moving production into, guess where? Other countries, such as Mexico. Or those, co those companies ended up failing because their costs were too high in the business model overall, okay? So these are just some important factors to keep in mind. If Tesla can get through the next year without being unionized, I think they'll be good from that point on. I don't think they'll be unionized anytime soon if they can just get through this next 12 months. Because as inflation becomes less of a worry for workers, I'm telling you, union interest is going to become less and less important, okay? Now, on today's Twitch live stream, which shout out to everybody that joins me over on those Twitch live streams uh, during the market trading action that I, that I do there, we were looking at a bunch of Google Trends data. And I, I, so we looked at a bunch for a bunch of different companies, and I found something very interesting in regards to the Model 3 and the Model Y. Very bullish. Some good news here, okay? Good news. So Google Trends data for Tesla Model 3 is really strong the past several months now at this point in time. So this kind of shows you 2021, 2020, 2022, right? And this is really like 2023 here. Now, the numbers are really strong. Now, it doesn't always equate to sales directly right away, right? But I can tell you, if there's that many people searching Tesla Model 3, 
it likely means that a lot of people are in at least the research phase of their next vehicle, right? So this is very positive, and it could be a delayed buy situation where people are waiting for interest rates to maybe drop some or something like that. But I can tell you, with the fact that Model 3 is up here right now for Google Trends is freaking phenomenal. Because I can just tell you, it, like Google, Google Trends for Model 3 hasn't been that good for a while until really the past six to nine months at this point in time. So I would say that is a very positive signal, and that should help Model 3, honestly, in future years. Now, what about Model Y? Well, check this out. Model Y also trading or trending much higher on Google Trends as well, right? This, I mean, it's been beast the last several months from Model Y. Look at where Model Y was previously on Google Trends data and look where it is now. This is kind of the, you know, anything below 25, I would say, is kind of lower amount of people searching it and, and kind of in trending and whatnot. And look at how many people were here recently. So once again, this means a lot of people are interested in searching, finding out more info on the Model Y. Okay, so all this, it, whether these these trans, whether these searches and people looking at these, and you know finding out more info, whether it translates to sales this year or next year or the year after, is you know that's up for debate. But the bottom line is, with that many people searching and finding out info, I'm going to say this is probably going to add up to sales overall over this next uh, you know couple years here. Okay, so. I definitely like that. I thought that was really good news. And, uh, you know, we need some good news on that front. But I can tell you this is good news here, right? More good news. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Elon Musk did a show with uh, Joe Rogan. Uh, obviously, that's going to get crazy views all around social media, whether it be YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, everywhere, right? Uh, X. So those clips got tons of views out there. Uh, one of them was talking about the Cybertruck and they actually shot an arrow at it, which was really interesting. And then Joe Rogan had The Rock on uh, this week as well. And on during The Rock's uh, interview, they actually asked The Rock, like, Rock asked what Joe Rogan's favorite vehicle is. And then Joe Rogan goes on like a several minute, like on how Tesla's so amazing and this and that and the Cybertruck. And then The Rock supposedly has never heard of the, the Cybertruck, which I'm like, has The Rock been under a rock? Like, like how, like, I literally don't understand how any human m would have not heard of the Cybertruck yet. Like, I'm, that's just, that's mind blowing to me. Either he's lying about that, or maybe the man's just so busy, he like, doesn't have time to even have heard of the Cybertruck. But uh, anyways, I thought that was big, because you know, you know, The Rock on Joe Rogan, that's a huge, that's going to get huge views. And once again, those are going to have, the clips are going to be played for months to go in the future. And so, it's nice to have some positive momentum there, right? Now, you want more positive momentum? I got more positive momentum for you. Look at this, okay? Interest rates for auto loans obviously shot to the moon over the past 18 months. We all know that, right? The good news is very high probability auto loan rates are going to actually start going down now over this next 6 to 12 months. Very high probability. I'd put it at about a 70% probability that auto loan rates are coming down over this next 6 to 12 months. I would put it at probably a 20% probability it's flat and only a 10% probability that auto loan rates are going higher than where they're at right now, okay? When I look at what, what the Fed's likely going to be up to, the Fed's next move's likely down whenever that comes. If I look at what's going on in the treasury market, everything spells auto loan rates are going to go down, okay? And so that's good. That's good overall if you want to be bullish on Tesla. Now, I also noticed, I, I, you know, just typing in Tesla, man, they are really pushing hard the federal tax credits, right? $7,500 federal tax credit. And I got to say, you know, if you're in the market for a Model 3 or Model Y, I, I don't understand why somebody wouldn't buy it, you know, this year. I think I don't think you're ever going to be able to get these vehicles cheaper than what you're able to get them right now. Between the tax credits and between the price cuts Tesla did, like, I don't see that, like, I don't... I, I don't see a way Tesla's going to go down on price anymore. I actually see them potentially going up on price at some point in 2024, especially if auto loan rates are dropping in 2024. I see a definitely a, a decently probable prob probability that they could go up on Model 3 and Model Y price in, in ultimately uh, 2024. So I don't know, man. We'll, we'll see how it all shakes out. But you know, you definitely have some bad news and good news in regards to Tesla. And uh, I thought I would cover that there, okay? Now let's go ahead and talk about Palantir. We have a lot of interesting developments here on the Palantir front we got to talk about. And, uh, you know, as a Palantir shareholder, I've been very pleased with what the company's doing as far as their numbers, their in their business model, everything like that, okay? So this article came out here today. Uh, Palantir stock, the party is over. 
Okay, this came out just a few hours ago. No, there's a, you know, a bunch was written in regards to this article, but the, the two main things I would address in the summary is Palantir Technologies revenue growth is slowing and market saturation is becoming a concern. We'll talk about that. And then the second thing I want to talk about is recommended to take significant profits and hold a small house position for long-term growth. We'll speak about that as well, okay? First off, let's talk about this whole revenue growth is slowing. Not factual, not factual, okay? Revenue growth is not slowing. There's actually a revenue acceleration going on in Palantir's business model right now, okay? If we go back and we look at the June to September quarter last year in 2022, the company grew revenue only by $4 million in that quarter. No, we go and we take a peek at the June quarter through September quarter and they grew revenue by 24 Five million dollars, And keep in mind, that's with a lot of the big government deals actually closing after that quarter was already over. And this is without even AIP really having a big a positive effect yet. The AIP effect is really going to come in in a major way in 2024. So we got a situation here where the, the best things haven't even happened for Palantir yet, right? And yet the company has a massive reacceleration of growth, right? If we want to look on a quarter over quarter basis, they went from $8 million of revenue growth to this last quarter, they did $25 million of, of revenue growth, right? So whichever way you want to slice it, whether you want to look at a year over year basis, or whether you want to look at quarter over quarter, Palantir factually is not a revenue slowing company. On a factual basis, Palantir is actually going through an immense revenue reacceleration. And I think we're actually early in this revenue reacceleration. I think 24 is going to be really fun as far as all that goes. And so I think that's the first thing we got to address. And I think I, I was just looked at that and I was just like, that's not, it's not factually accurate, right? The other thing I, I think is, you know, a little crazy is it's recommended to take significant profits and hold a house portion for long-term growth. And I was just thinking like, I was thinking about Palantir's shareholder base, right? And I can understand on some stocks, it makes sense to take profits and, and run out of them, right? Let's be honest. Palantir's a cult stock. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a cult stock. And I actually love cult stocks. I love cult stocks. I mean, if the business model is doing great, and I got a lot of other shareholders that are focused long term and want to be part of that story long term, I love that. Because the best stocks actually in the market over time are cult stocks. Amazon, cult stock. Apple, cold stock. Tesla, cold stock. Berkshire Hathaway, the biggest cold stock. Think about Berkshire's returns over time, right? Think about that company. They freaking have to rent an arena, an arena for their shareholder meeting. Tell me that's not the biggest freaking cold stock in the history of mankind. Who else is renting out arenas? Come on, man. Who else is renting out arenas? You could be flipping my flapjacks here, Okay. By the way, it's completely random, but while I was searching for an arena picture of uh, Berkshire Hathaway, <laughs> Buffett, Gates, and Ludacris? Like, that's so random. Like, I, I was like, I had to click on it. I had to make sure it wasn't AI. Uh, no, that's an actual picture. Ludacris was, this is probably, uh, this photo looks like it's probably 15, 20 years old, but I just thought that was funny. What's Ludacris doing there, okay? So, the bottom line is, I don't think they understand Palantir shareholder base. These folks are not in Palantir. Like, you don't buy stock like Palantir. To just be in a short term. You're in this stock for the next, you're in this stock for the next, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, right? That's what people are thinking. I know people that are predicting that Palantir stock is going to 500 plus dollars a share. I know people that are making predictions that Palantir is going to 100 plus dollars a share over the coming years. You know, these folks, uh, they're in this for the long term. That's the bottom line with that. You would say, take some profits here. No, okay. These people are not interested in taking profits. They have no, no, no belief, no thought of like, oh, I'm going to take profits. And hell no, okay. It's a different, this is a different group of individuals. No, I saw this news came out here today. Peter Thiel's Mirthro LP sells $48 million in Palantir shares, right? And Peter Thiel was an early stage investor in Palantir. Peter Thiel's a venture capital fund sold $48 million in Palantir Technologies, shares acquired a decade ago. So one could look at this if you, you know, look at it from a negative perspective and say, oh, Peter Thiel must think Palantir stock's overvalued, it's going to go down, things like that. Means held the stock for you know a decade. Uh, so at the end of the day, if he wants to sell some shares, it's their choice, right? Teal co-founded Palantir 20 years ago. The enterprise software company went public in 2020, and the stock has doubled since then. Vanguard is a top shareholder of Palantir with 8.76% of the stock according to TIPS rank. Vanguard Index Funds, 
Interesting. Holds 7.13% stake. We haven't even gotten the SP 500 yet. I just want to put that out there. On Wednesday, it was reported that billionaire investor Felipe Management took a position. <laughs> some of these words, I'm like, I'm not even going there. Okay, we'll just say Felipe, billionaire Felipe, took a position in Palantir Technologies on Wednesday. That's good. Earlier this month, Palantir issued guidance and topped uh, estimates, after which Bush called the company the messy of AI, right? And that leads us into this. I don't know if you guys saw this came out on Monday. Investment firm Webb Bush Security said on Monday that a new bull market in technology stocks has started, with spending set to accelerate next year, and Apple is a top pick in the space. Analyst Dan Ives said that Wall Street is significantly underestimating the amount of spending in the cloud and artificial intelligence for the next year. As a result, he thinks spending will rise between 20 and 25%. Wow, which is especially as use cases explode in the enterprise and consumer spaces. Quote, while it is still murky macro in the Fed shadow, 10-year remains, uh, let's call it albatross, around tech stocks and multiples, we believe a short covering for the ages for the tech sub sector into year end is on the horizon and the fundamental picture for growth tech stocks is rock solid based on the recent, uh, recent checks, he said. Quote, we believe the new tech bull market has now begun and, te and tech stocks are set up for a strong 2024 as AI spending tidal wave hits shores of the broader tech market, right? And he thinks the companies that are going to benefit the most are Apple, which is debatable. Uh, Microsoft, which is kind of a no-brainer. Of course, Microsoft's going to benefit huge with their chat GPT investment and obviously what they're doing um, on their own product side. Google, yes. But the, a lot of people are worried about is Google just offsetting some of their other business there. So that's a kind of a debatable one. Palo Alto Networks, no opinion there. Palantir, obviously, right? And he calls Palantir the messy of AI. Zscaler, CrowdStrike, MondoDB, probably, okay? So I thought that was interesting there as well, right? No, this is such an underrated thing. And I mean, it's absolutely underrated. And, and you know, I've mentioned it and mentioned it, and I'm going to keep mentioning it because I just think it's massively underrated. I saw this article uh, at a Motley Fool yesterday, the, the 140 plus reasons to remain bullish on Palantir's growth prospects. Palantir has more than 140 artificial intelligence boot camps planned with companies this month, right? And I just think it's so underrated. Uh, and I don't think there's enough people talking about AIP in, in these boot camps in the matter, you know, the fact that in a day or two, Customers can get results and see how Palantir can help them versus, you know, it used to be like a six-month process. I think that's just a fundamental change in the business model that I think we're going to see help the business dramatically in 2024 and in future years. I think that's way underrated right now. And I think that's something the bears on Palantir are not even looking at. And I think even a lot of the bulls are not paying close enough attention to that. I think it's massive, man. And uh, we'll see how massive it is in 2024 when we look at the numbers, right? No. And in regards to the numbers, we have certain very exciting things going on. I, I saw this illustration out here in regards to Palantir and kind of where their money's going, you know, how much money's coming in, different different ways. Obviously, we can see the government is the weakness of the business right now, 12%, but don't be surprised if those government numbers boost up big time, big time in 2024 based upon a lot of these big deals Palantir has going through right now. Oh, baby, don't be surprised that government number is a whole lot better than that next year. Commercial with AIP, don't be surprised if that number reaccelerates as well. But that's not the important part of this. The important part is right here, okay? 16.8% total revenue growth, but the gross profit, 21.6% growth there, right? Now, obviously, the company also went from a loss to net income. That's a whole other situation. But I just think this is very important. They're growing, they're growing gross profit at a much faster clip than they're growing revenue. Now, on top of that, they dropped operating expenses 5%. They dropped sales and marketing 3.6%. And they also dropped general administrative 13.8%. So what they're setting up for is a lean and mean Palantir at this point in time, where every dollar that comes into Palantir is going to be so much so much more important than a dollar previously. And so much more that dollar is going to hit the bottom line now than, than previously expected. And so I'll give you kind of an example here. Okay, here's kind of an example. So let's say uh, Palantir grows revenue 20% in 2024, which I think is actually a conservative number. But let's say they do that. I will expect net income to be at minimum 30%, but probably much more than, than 30%. The way they're keeping their expenses in line, their operating expenses, right? And the fact that the gross profit's growing much more rapidly than the revenue, that smells like a situation where we're going to see a net income growth far exceeding, far exceeding whatever revenue growth they have. And that's one of the, in my opinion, one of the holy grails of business models, when you can have your bottom line grow at a much faster clip than your top line. 
Let's say we got a situation where revenue grows like 30% in 2024, which I don't think is a stretch out. I think that's probably like a 50-50, to be honest, whether they grow like 30% revenues. I would expect net income to be up 45% plus in that sort of situation. 45% plus, plus. So like 45% is the minimum amount in that sort of scenario. So we're going we're gonna to watch a Palantir emerge here in 2024. Then my opinion is going to be a cash flow machine and a profit machine. Very different than the Palantir we used to have, which was just known for massive losses and stock-based compensation, right? Oh, did I forget the share buyback on? Oh, oh man. Oh, man. Think about the share buyback added on top of that, right? I mean, my gosh, you take all those shares off the market and, and, and you know what's going to happen there, EPS? <laughs> oh my gosh. As their net income increases dramatically next year, holy smoke, because that's no dang flip and flapjack and jokers, right? That's huge. And so with Palantir, really the only negative thing people can say at this point, in my opinion, the only thing that you could say negative about Palantir that at least holds some weight, I'll put it like that, okay, is the stock is expensive, right? It trades at 67 times expected you know, expect a forward P for next year's numbers. That There's no doubt about it. That's expensive. That's over 3X with the average stock in the market trades at, right? But if we think about this, one is I think analysts are far too low with their revenue estimates. And if they're far too low with their revenue estimates, they're probably way further off in regards to their earnings per share. So there is a potential here. I think a pretty high probability that the reality is this, this company is not trading at 60, 67 times next year's numbers is a very high probability that maybe it's trading at 45 times or 50 times next year numbers. Now, those might still seem expensive, but for a company that has Palantir sort of growth trajectory over the next five to 10 years, that's not expensive at all. And so that's where you get in this kind of conflicting opinion here about is Palantir expensive or not, right? No, I also saw a lot of people making a big deal because Kathy Wood just very recently bought a bunch of, well, a bunch is relative, but she bought Palantir stock recently, okay? Now, personally, I'm not that interested in this, okay? I don't, I don't know about this, okay? Here's the deal. Kathy Wood was selling massive amounts of shares as that stock crashed, okay? And then once it started going up, it seems like she started to buy. Okay, cool. But it's just like, you know, I, I don't like that right off the bat. Secondly, she, you know, 1.35% of the portfolio, is that conviction? Is that conviction in Palantir or is that just kind of like, oh, Palantir seems like it's kind of a hot stock, let's buy some shares? That, that's another thing I kind of wonder here. With a 1.3% of the portfolio? Like, like, here's the way I think about it, right? If I have conviction in stock, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride big money in that stock, right? If we look at my Mag 6, which is my Magnificent 6 stocks, right? 34% Meta, 22% Tesla, 8.5% Amazon, 6% Elf, 6% Palantir, and 5.6% in PayPal, Right? I'm going to ride the stocks that I have the most conviction in. I'm going to have those stocks be heavy, heavy weights. If I have a stock that's like one percentage of the portfolio, it means it's likely more speculative to me. And I don't have, um, you know, I don't feel the most comfortable putting a huge portion of money in that, right? And I have some stocks that, that would kind of fit that criteria, right? The Vons, the Planets, Honest, Fubos. Those are stocks I, I believe in long term. And I, you know, I hope and I think they can become these big things and, all that, all that stuff, but at the end of the day, they have immense risk. And so I keep those position sizes obviously smaller, right? Versus these companies that I think, you know, have very attractive risk rewards. And I think they're not taking the, the most risk out there. So the bottom line is with the Kathy Wood stuff, 1% of the portfolio. Okay. Now, the last thing I'll say here is let the short-term crap be the short-term crap. You know, stocks like Tesla, stocks like Palantir, they're always going to have stuff crop up. They're always going to have negative articles, negative things said about them. You know, let that be what that's going to be. Focus on the long-term. You know, if you love certain stocks for the long-term, focus on them long-term. You know, make sure the business model is going where you want the business model to go over the coming years. And if that's all lining up, cool. And if macro gets in the way for a bit, it is what it is. Just understand the macro will not always be there. And eventually the macro subsides and eventually you get back to a healthy demand environment and all those things kind of, you know, go from there and growth and prosper and those sorts of things, folks. So I thought that's important. Appreciate y'all joining me as always. Thanks so much for being here, folks. Thank you for being subscribed to the channel. Make sure you sign up for the deal, the massive deal that is coming, folks. Pin comment down there seven days away. Every single person needs to make sure you're taking advantage of that. 62 bucks. That's a holy smoke. It's no, no joke is deal. Okay. Yeah access to all that for 62? Like, come on, man. Make sure you join in there. That will be pinned comment down there. Much love and have a great day.